Today's episode of the Inside EV Podcast is brought to you by E-Rain EV Tires. E-Rain EV Tires are specifically engineered for electric vehicles. Using an advanced manufacturing process called liquid phase mixing, E-Rain EV Tires technology creates a tire with lower rolling resistance and longer range while offering low levels of wear and high grip. All this while staying affordable. Go to E-RangeTires.com. That's E-R-A-N-G-E Tires.com to find Find your EV, your EV, set of tires. Hello, and welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for November the 18th, 2022. This is episode number 137. On today's show, we'll be talking about the Draco Dragon debut, the new Toyota Prius, which is not an EV. And the Toyota BZ comp set has been revealed. I'm Dominic Yoni, Inside EV's forum moderator and Inside EV's editor. Joining us today via Time Machine is the resolute Tom Logney, Inside EV's editor and host of the YouTube channel State of Charge. We also have the non-Martian Mr. Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which is av available on all the best podcast platforms. Joining us all the way from Romania will be Inside EV's editor, Andre Nadelia who is also the host of a YouTube channel, One Tire Fire. And also far away, Kyle Connor will join us from the frozen but majestic Scandinavian country of Norway, where he is produ producing high voltage videos for a growing number of YouTube channels. So welcome, everybody. Hello, it's just me, not everybody. <laughs> I, do I, I think I start with an apology, Dom, because we're going to play in Tom's pre-recorded half an hour at the beginning. Hmm. And so I got that ready on a second screen. But I think that means double uh, sound so right. if if there was some freaky i think there almost was certainly there's, from looking at the comments echoing going on so somebody described it as taking the uh the, the beatles kind of uh double track a little bit too far sorry about that entirely my fault i have no idea what i'm doing uh, <laughs> with computers if tom's bit plays out then we're all going to be very fortunate um but you know hopefully it'll work okay all right so this <laughs> this week we're going to start with what we've been driving and then get to the news. The LA Auto Show is in full swing as we speak, and there are like a number of new cars to talk about and some news. Uh, unfortunately, Tom couldn't be with us live this morning. Uh, I believe he's on his on an airplane now coming back. Uh, but Martin and I sat down with him earlier this week to talk about his Porsche trip and his thoughts on the Tesla making its charging connector and charge port design open to auto, other automakers. So, yeah, let's go and go straight to that. I really hope this works. If all it right. doesn't, it's all my fault. Let's hope this works. Ooh. Hmm. Okay, so first, I'm in the air right now as this podcast is going on, going on because <laughs> this week, actually, I went to Germany with Mercedes, um, so uh, that's why I couldn't join you guys live, so we pre-recorded this. Last week, I did go to Italy with Porsche. Um, we got a chance to drive the Taycan with the new software. I've actually had the opportunity to do that already, but uh, hey, I'll take every opportunity Porsche gives me to drive a Taycan, especially around a beautiful area like Northern Italy, we're in the Milan area. So that was a lot of fun. We also learned about uh, some information on Porsche's new electric um, platform, the PPE. And I also learned about for, uh, for geez, Porsche's <laughs> new Formula E race car, the 99X. I was actually at the, uh, the, uh, their world introduction of their new Formula E racer. Right on. So, uh, so you so you drove some Tycons. Did you drive any Tycons that you hadn't driven before? They have like I guess they have the uh, they have the Cross Cruiser mode, but they also have the other one too, right? The yeah. So, one. so it was cool. They had a lineup of like just about every version of the Tycon you can you can imagine. And the thing is, you know, I was there with with maybe ten or twelve, eh, probably at least twelve other journalists from you know all over, and most of them have not had the opportunity to drive 
Taycons, or maybe you've driven one. So right. everyone was like, I want a Turbo S, I want a Turbo. And I felt bad because I've driven every single one, the GTS, the Cross Turismo, the Sport Turismo, the 4S, the, the rear wheel drive. So I, I just kind of let everybody pick the cars they wanted. And then I took the last one. Well, I mean, there was a, there was a few for me to choose from, but I actually took the blue one that's right in front of us on the screen there. It was just a regular 4S. Uh, okay. You know, the turbos and, tur and yeah. turbo S's were gone. And so were the, the GTS and the Sport Turismos. Uh, but, you know, um, like I said, I'm very lucky. I get to drive the Taycans all the time here in here in uh, North America. And uh, so I let the other guys have a little bit of fun. Not saying I didn't have fun. Because oh, yeah. the any version of the Taycan, even the rear wheel drive base version, is is a great driving experience. So hey, um, I had some fun. And plus, I was over there in Italy, and I didn't want to get in trouble with the laws, going crazy. I feel a little more comfortable over here speeding than I do when I go over to Europe. So um, I, I think just driving the 4S kept kept me uh, grounded a little bit. Yeah, when you get pulled over and you've got to get your international driving license or your US driving license out and be like, hey, I'm press. And it's like, that's, yeah. you know, you don't speak Italian and you know what, I'm guessing anyway. But, you know, and they're, they're going to be in broken English. Probably yeah. best don't get pulled over. Yeah. Um, but so that's the, so the 4S, is that the, the one with the most range? Is that what I'm thinking? So of? no, just the rear wheel drive would be the oh, most range, you know, the right, the, okay. the, the just the base Taycan. So, you know, I, I've done, like I said, range testing on this. So I just actually had a couple of hours of fun, you know, and just drove around the mountainside and took some pictures. Um, you know, it's, it's a good gig if you can get it. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not complaining. It was, it, it, it was, it was fun. Man, I wish I could have gone. I have a friend actually who lives right over that area somewhere in the top of a mountain overlooking the valley where they make a uh, pottery and things. Right. So I'm a little, just a little jealous. Yeah. <laughs> that was it was cool and uh we were warned that there's a lot of um traffic cameras for speeding and so forth so that was even another reason why i said you know what let me just let me just take a 4s and just <laughs> cruise around and, ha and have some fun which 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 i did and uh i tell you I, i'm I, i've said this before on the podcast i love the tycons every version of them i i you know the cross turismo the sport turismo the new gts uh, even the, like i said i'd be totally happy with just the base rear wheel drive Taycan. It's it's such a good driving experience. So Porsche really nailed it with the Taycan. I'm, I'm a big fan of Taycans. They just feel so good just driving, even like in a straight line. It's nice. Great driving experience. Porsche, like I said, I when I when before I drove the Taycan, I was really concerned that it wouldn't like feel like a Porsche, you know, that it would just, you know, uh, be an electric car and they maybe they would, you know, just do it because they have to do it but no they you could tell they really put effort into this and wanted to make it the best vehicle they could and i i think they did a great job and i'm really looking forward to their next the the, the macan uh right. you know which uh i had a chance to see just some prototype out at, at this event we didn't really get it we did certainly didn't get to sit in them or drive them they're still you know pretty early on in in, in testing and validation so, but we did learn uh, about their uh, the new platform, the the, the Porsche's new um, PPE platform, and it's interesting because the the Taycan's J1 platform, you know, it's only going to be used for the Taycan and of course, you know, that that the Audi um, RSC e-tron GT, uh, which is you know just a Taycan in, in different clothes. But um, you know, it's interesting that Porsche developed this platform and is only using it for basically one car. Now I know it's a lot of variations of that car. But, you know, you would almost think that that, that would be used for, you know, the Macan or, or, or Cayenne or so, some, some other Porsche, but it's not. They're going into um, PPE now. And, um, you know, we got, we got to learn a little bit about that. And, uh, I mean, what so, some of the things that we talked about was, uh, interestingly, you know, the Taycan has two different battery sizes. Well, they, they spent a lot, evidently Porsche spent a lot of time trying to figure out what is the perfect battery size for, like, when you consider, you know, weight and driving dynamics and range, and uh, you know, they came up with a hundred kilowatt hour, and it, it's interesting, you know, we, yeah. we pre kind of pressed them on it, like, you know, it's, it's a nice round number, and they're like, no, like if it was ninety nine, we would have come up, we would have been ninety nine, you know, but that was the perfect size for weight and balance and driving dynamics. So the Macan. Um, and at least the Macan for certain will not have different battery sizes. And they were almost talking as if PPE is going to be a hundred kilowatt hour. 
at least in the beginning, even different models. Um, and, uh, and, and, and that's it, you know, uh, because that's, we, that is what is perfect. You know, so the German engineers, you know, decided that that is the right size and that's what we're going to use. Um, it's going to be able, it's an 800 volt architecture like the, like Tycon. It's going to be able to charge at slightly higher DC fast charge rates. Not they much, they said. No, and, I, and of course I pressed them. Um, and, uh, and I c couldn't get them to, to give that out. And then I asked somebody else in a round of, well, what, what's, you know, how, how much, how much amps can, can, uh, can this battery <laughs> take, you know, and I, I, I asked it in six different ways and they weren't biting. And, um, so, but they said it's greater than Tycon, but a little bit more than Tycon. So what they're saying is, you know, Tycon does five to 80% in uh, 22 and a half minutes. And there were quoting times of 25 minutes for this. So it's a bigger battery. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, with it, so it does take a little bit longer, but the battery's bigger and the charging time is slightly greater. And here's another thing that I thought was really interesting. You know, Tycon uh, Performance Plus batteries, 94.3 kilowatt hour, 93.4 kilowatt hour. And the usable is uh, 84.7, I think. It's about a, about a 10 kilowatt hour buffer, and the, uh, which is about 10%. And the, uh, the, the performance battery also has about a 10% battery buffer. But on PPE, they're only going to have about a 3% battery buffer. So there's going to be two kilowatt hour buffer at the bottom end and the top end somewhere between one and two kilowatt hours. So it's going to let you use a lot more of the battery. So um, that's interesting. And, you know, we, we, we asked them about that. And, you know, what, 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 why is this? Is it better battery cells? Is it uh, the fact that you've the learnings from Tycon? And they said, well, it's a combination of both. It is better cells. They're newer generation cells. Uh, but they said they learned a lot from studying Tycon and Tycon battery degradation. And um, they came out of the box very conservative with Tycon as far as the uh, the usable capacity because they still weren't sure how, you know, DC fast charging was going to was going to affect it, how the battery was going to degrade. But now they they've come to realize that um, they can use a bigger percentage of the battery. So I've heard similar things from BMW. If you notice the new BMWs now have a, have a, have a larger percentage of the percentage mm -hmm. of the battery that's usable. So it seems like the manufacturers are understanding kind of like what Tesla has for a long time that, you know, you can use a, a, a big swath of the battery. Maybe you're going to recommend not to charge to hundred percent for daily use, but um, you really can use a, a large portion of that battery without um, having, you know, early battery degradation. I wonder if getting to 300 kilowatts is almost a, a psychological barrier or even it will look good in the marketing materials, but that's, you know, that would be, well, more than 10% better than what the Tycon charge at, which is 270. So uh, that that's probably more than, a, you know, slightly quicker. So maybe it wouldn't get to 300. Look, it doesn't need it. 270 is fine. 275, 280 is fine. But 300 would be a I don't know. Like you say, it's, the, it's a round number, isn't it? Psychological like uh, thing to uh, to to get in terms of charging speed, and then in terms of usability, it's. I wonder if there's any parallels that we can draw between, you know, on the show last week we were talking about Audi with the e-tron and the Q8 e-tron, or the uh, um, and then uh, the the battery on that, which is going to be bigger. Um, but the charge curve was totally different. Like the the e-tron at the minute just kind of goes up and just sits there, and it just it's, it's not even a curve. It's a it's a charge flat line. Um, and this was very much a peaking at about 20%, 30%, whatever, I forget. And then it was a, a decline. And that's going to be a very different. And I wonder if Porsche will change, physically change the way that the charging behaves, because that's one of the best things about the Taycan is that it charges really quickly. And, and, and the thermal management is good. And, you know, the Audi thing, it's not I'm saying that each one is worse. In some ways, it's worse, which is weird. Yeah. Uh, but it's not. So I wonder if they'll change the philosophy of Taycan charging. Any thoughts? So, you know, they gave us the, the time. So we know that, you know, we, we know it's going to be a couple minutes more, but, you know, there might be as many, much as, excuse me, it might be as much as 10 kilowatt hour more of battery to add back when you consider it's a bigger battery to begin with. And then there's a bigger percentage of it being used. So that 75%, if you go five to 80%, that 75% of the battery is going to be about 10 more kilowatt hour than Tycon. So if it's only going to take about two minutes more at this time, two to three minutes more, Martin, the mm. the, the the charging curve can't be that much different, um, even if like they did stress slightly. So I, I doubt if it's 300 kilowatt. Um, yeah. And, and you know, it's it's all about the curve. We talk about this a lot. 
I know that number's sexy, 300 or, you know, the peak <laughs> charging rate. No, really, it's it's what people want to hear. Oh, we can charge yeah, at right. this yeah, or whatever. Or, or 350 fact, is like the magic number now. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But the fact of the matter is, I mean, everybody goes crazy over that. But the fact of the matter is, it's the curve. I don't care yeah. what the maximum charging rate is. I just mm. want to see a, a chunk of the charging curve up at a high rate. You know, you could, you can, you can, you know, max out at two, th- like if, if, if you pull over 200 kilowatts and you hold that till close to 80%, it's a great charging EV, you know, mm. so you could say 285, 300, but if it peaks at that for four or five minutes, and then by the time it's at 50% state of charge, you're down to hundred kilowatts. You know, it, it's 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 not that great of a charging EV. So I I would doubt Porch would really step that far behind, and they really can't if they they told us the the five to eighty percent time. So it's got to be it's it's got to be relatively flat uh, the charging curve. Now these cars look pretty much ready to roll, right? So <laughs> stick a new coat of paint on that, and you're ready to stick it on the market. So when right. when do we get the McCann EV? Because they look pretty complete. So to be clear, these were stock photos that they gave us. These I didn't take these pictures. Oh, okay. I only got to see one Macan, and it was inside, and we couldn't even open the doors, and everything was covered. So, but these are um, the EV, right? These are the Macan. Um, it's just, yeah, like yeah, okay, cool. Yeah, yeah, no, no but, they, but they these sent are some us mules, though, right? They these sent us still... the media kit that had right. you know the, the 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 pictures of it. So I'm really excited about the Macan. I think it's going to be a great EV. It's it's yeah. really going to be it, if. Porsche does a good job with it. I mean, the Macan in 2021 was Porsche's number one selling vehicle. It sold like 80,000 yeah. of them or something like that, more than 80,000. It accounted for 30% of the worldwide sales. Think about that, the whole brand. So, yeah, yeah that's the one there that we got to see. You can see there's <laughs> tape on the back window and everything. <laughs> Great. Yeah, I love so, that. Yeah. So, um, uh, you know, Porsche's goal is to sell 80 plus percent of BEVs by 2030, not plug in hybrids. 80% of the brand's worldwide sales are fully electric by 2030. That's seven years from now. So they Big need deal. to start selling mm. some of the, the cars that sell in more volume. I mean, Taycan's been a, a huge sales success for, for Porsche. But, I mean, it, almost any version of the Taycan's more than $100,000. They, they need to sell the more affordable Porsches if there is such a thing. But um, the Macan is. You know, that's that that's the lower price car that is is high volume so if they nail it with the macan if this is a great ev um that it's going to really put porsche in a good position to hit their goals um and uh when is it coming well it was supposed to come in 2023 but uh porsche's had some not porsche just the volkswagen group has had software problems and evidently the software problems are so severe it's going to delay the vehicle for almost a year it, you know it's going to it's not going to be available to 2024 at this point which is really disappointing and we, we we find that out because they of the ipo so porsche is now its own entity and in that investor uh, information download if you like that that deck they have to they have to reveal all and so i think back back when they they first started talking about the shape of the business is they were like, well, we think McCann's going to be delayed. So that's not, that's not new news, but it's good that they did share it. Um, but man, I, that, you know, we hear a lot about software because the software in the ID3, ID4, uh, Volkswagen parent group is not terrible, but it's also not the, not the best out there. Uh, so man, uh, it's, been, it's been a problem for VW software. Well, yeah. for we can't, we can't sugarcoat that for the whole right. Volkswagen group, Martin. It's, 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 it seems to be holding them back. Well, I, I've a friend, I, I have a friend who owns a Tycon and uh, apologies, Dom, uh, pardon me uh, very quickly. Um, uh, and he says it's the worst, it's the worst bit of the experience of the ownership experience is the, is the, the software when he came to update it recently with that big package, it was a case of, you know, wait till there's a full moon and stand on one leg and, you know, do a secret handshake and somebody might turn up and update your car. He, he said it was just because yeah. he also owns about has owned a bunch of Teslas. He sells Teslas and he's like, it was, you know, the car is phenomenal, but the software, like the idea, like I don't think it, it was it over the air update. He might even have to take it back to Porsche. Um, yeah. it's, and yeah. it's like, he said it was just, it was just onerous. Anyway, apologies. Well, this latest big update that they had now, it's a huge update. It updated all the systems. So I, I this is a, this was a big one but you had to take it to the dealer and it was a full day's work at the dealership. This wasn't bring it to the dealer, go sit in service, have a cup of coffee. You, you're leaving in an hour with the car. No, it was 24 hours at the dealership. So, 
yeah, you know, it's not nothing like, you know, software updates that Tesla have where, you know, you get a, you get a notification on your app. You click, oh, yeah, you know, I'm watching TV. 20 minutes, you click software update. I mean, I've owned two Teslas. What a fantastic experience, um, you know, software. Although my Lightning, I've had that already. I've had software updates on the Lightning. I can't remember if the Rivian has had that yet. But, um, you know, so it is, it's been an issue for the Volkswagen Group software. And they give you a new owner's manual as well. You get a yeah. whole new paper. You get the whole thick, weighty, a whole new one. They take your old one off you and give you a new one. Like, come you on. have to give it back. <laughs> you do. They, they, they what, if you're, what if you've yeah. lost it, Martin? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they won't. They want it back. They won't want give it, you they, your car. They don't want it on I eBay. Sold I it on eBay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's fascinating. Anyway, that's cool. It's good to learn. Thank you. So, so you also looked at the new uh, Formula E Porsche entry is that was was there other bits of that, of the experience that you wanted to mention before we got into that? Yeah, well, re really quickly on that because for some reason it seems like nobody's interested in Formula E. I love it, but we do right. articles on Inside EVs and they just die; like they get no <laughs> views. Yeah. It's a shame because it's fun. Um, and the so series yeah, is progressing, right? So this this year's car, this is Porsche's first car, I think, it, right? It it just it just keeps getting better. The series, right. the cars do. If you remember the original cars in the races, they had to be. Um, uh, they, they they had two cars for each race because yeah. they had to the, the batteries wouldn't last and 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 then they came out with the battery actually designed by Lucid or Lucid's sub sub Ativa. subsidiary yeah. you know that the, right. the battery where it could last the whole race um, and here's the crazy here's the interesting thing on the new cars now there's a lot of the cars that have to be standardized you know this battery size and things like that the new cars the battery is smaller from 52 kilowatt hour from last year. Now the new cars only have a 38.5 kilowatt hour battery pack. That's tiny. Uh, it's tiny, but they can do it, Martin, because now the, the vehicles are allowed to have front motors, but they're not all wheel drive. Those front motors are just for regen. Oh, no, so I read now, that. So, yeah, there's no physical brake. So when your yeah. left foot, because it's a go-kart, so when your left foot goes down, there's no physical braking system. It's, I, I believe it's the first racing car in the world to have so, no physical connection between your left foot and there's no brake disc there's no brake pads it's simply regen and so that's a heck of a task to get right yeah and it can regen up to 600 kilowatt wow so wow. so, so that's I mean, why to. yeah so that's why the the incredible amount of energy that's recuperated i think they said 40 percent of the race good. is driven on wow. regen so that's, um, that's really good. So, right. Well, that's why they were able to um, make the battery smaller, which in turn made the cars like 110 pounds lighter. Right. They're more powerful now, too. Um, mm -hmm. the, 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 so they, they have more horsepower. They're lighter, more agile. Um, uh, the, they charge faster. And here's a, the, the, the cool thing about the charging is if a car does have to pit because uh, it's they've they had they've mismanaged their energy. Now, the goal is to not mm -hmm. have to stop you know to recharge but if you do have to they can add four to five kilowatt hours in 30 seconds yes. because it can charge at 600 kilowatts like it can regen at 600 kilowatts right so so the pits have these these dc chargers that can add back because four to five kilowatt would would all you'd be need to finish the race if if you think you're you know we've seen this on formula e before where the car's in the last lap like the car could be in the lead, then all of a sudden he's slowing down, slow, and he just everybody passes him, and he finishes like at ten miles an hour. <laughs> he ran ran out of you know they, they, they mismanaged his energy. So you know you 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 can now the cars can get that boost if they need it, you know, and and you're really not uh, you know out of the race for for for, for very long. I wonder if it's enough of it's probably it's probably not enough of an offset or a differential, but I wonder if it in any way throws up a strategy choice for the race teams and whether they go absolutely hell for leather uh, and then do a 30 second pit stop. If yeah. you can build up a 30 second lead, it, it's not like, you know, it's not like a 10 second pit stop in combustion formula. Yeah. So it probably wouldn't work, but yeah, it's, it's still it, it, considerable yeah. time, but it, it depending on the race, you know, wow. Just, so this should be a pretty good season. Hopefully, it yeah, kick, it kicks off in Mexico City in January. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Eighteen races, oh, eighteen cool. races, thirteen cities. Where do they go this year? Uh, year? See, Mexico City, uh, oh. Diria, Saudi Arabia. There's two races. Hyperabad 
India. Yep. There's a couple to be determined. Sao Paulo, Brazil, Berlin, Germany, Monaco. Monaco. Ooh, yes. that's going to be cool. Yep. Jakarta. There's a couple of races in Jakarta, Rome, and back in London, in your neck yeah. of the woods. Yeah. Cool. Uh, and there's disappointed. another couple to be, there's like three to be determined. Determine. And there's a couple of, oh, Seoul, South Korea, two races. Wow. I'm, I'm disappointed they're not doing it in New York this year because yeah. where they do it, they, there's some construction going on uh, in Brooklyn. So um, right. it's not that they're canceling doing it in Brooklyn. They right. just, for at least this year, they couldn't do it because there's some some uh, big project that's being done. Maybe um, we'll get Miami or Long Beach. Yeah. Or, well, or the World Circuit of the Americas, actually, and outside of Austin. That'd be, good. that'd be nice. They race on the same track at Mexico, I think. Is that the same Formula One track? And they race at, um, obviously, Monaco. Uh, so, you know, there's no reason why these cars shouldn't start to go to more, what I would still call a conventional racetrack, ones that have got history and ones that have got... Although, I, on the flip side, I'll contradict myself. One of the great things about electric racing is the noise and, and everything that comes with it. It allows them to go into areas and bring motorsport to a whole bunch of new fans that you can't take 20 loud combustion cars into the middle of a financial district of a city. So, uh, so, you know, that's, that's a good reason to carry on going where they are going, but it's should be exciting. And, yeah. uh, and I, ho I hope it begins to cut through. I must admit, I do enjoy watching motorsport and there's something about the noise element that, that you can't get away from. You can't get away. And I'm, you know, we're all the three of us, the biggest electric fans in the world, but there's something about that noise. So I don't know. Um, I wonder if it'll catch on or whether, I don't know whether they go racing with e-fuels or something in the future. It'll, yeah, I don't, I don't know. know. Did, did they have to mention, Tom, the performance gap between like the 99X Formula E car here and like the Formula One cars in general? No. Okay. No. I just wonder how close, because they're, they're closing There's the a gap, pretty big right? gap. There's a pretty big gap. Right, right still. Yeah, <laughs> no doubt. Yeah, yeah. no doubt. But, um, but it's, a small, it's definitely a lot smaller gap than there was previously. Well, they're getting faster. They're getting better, lighter. You know, right. as I said, more agile. Wow. Um, so, you know, things are looking up for Formula. It should should be a should be a fun season. I, ho I hope to get to uh, at least one of them somewhere. Well, I really enjoy we, it. Before we let you go, Tom. Uh, so Tesla put out this thing this week on its uh, on its blog on November 11th, opening the new um, the opening the North American charging standard. So it's talking about, I guess, opening up the. Uh, Tesla DC fast charging, supercharging, uh, or just the charging standard, I guess, because that would be AC as well, because they use the same connector for AC and DC. But uh, yeah, opening it up to OEMs and so yeah, it's interesting that they called it the North American charging standard. You know, that's the thing about standards. You know, <laughs> there's always another <laughs> one. <laughs> um, it's it, yeah, you know, I haven't fully let this digest yet, to be honest with you. Um, my initial reaction is, you know. Um, I don't believe that it's going to be the standard that everybody uses in North America. You can call it whatever you want. Um, I like the Tesla uh, a connector better. I think it's a more elegant solution. Uh, you know, I, I'm not uh, an engineer to know if there are any specific advantages to CCS. I don't believe there is, um, but I am going to talk to, uh, uh, you know, a charging infrastructure engineer soon and, and try to figure this thing out. Um, what, what, is disappointing to me is that I think Tesla could have had this been the North American standard if they would have opened it up for everybody to use back in 2011, 2012, when it first came out, you know, they made this great blog post that all our patents are yours or whatever they, 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 or belong, they, to they us, said, yes. belong to us, which, which is total BS. You know, uh, you know, if that was true, they wouldn't have to announce this now and say, okay, now <laughs> you can use it, you know? So, yeah. um, and I actually know back 10 years ago uh, for a fact that some of the OEMs did contact Tesla to right. see if they were if they would be able to 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 use it and and have supercharger access. And they knew, they knew they'd have to pay for it, you know. And they, um, I actually, you know, I have NDA signed where I can't talk about it, but I know for a fact this happened. Um, and uh, the, the 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 cost of admission was too high. At least that's what the OEMs viewed it as. It was just too onerous to 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 accept Tesla's terms, so they 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 said, okay, we're, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna go see CS. I I f firmly believe if if from the beginning Tesla made this announcement in 2012 and said, look, we have made the North American charging standard. You know, th th yeah. here it is. Have at it. Everybody could use it. I think we might all be using it at this at this point. And, um, and but, Tesla would have another huge revenue stream. 
yeah, I, I think it's kind of a little late on their yeah. on their part, and I don't think it's going to happen. And I don't know if this is some if there's some reason that they would have done this to get um, uh, to, that will help them qualify for some of the federal money now that that's being thrown around there. Um, but it's it's interesting that they've chosen now to do it when all these other vehicles are out there. Every other manufacturer is using CCS. And, and now they want to say, OK, oh, by the way, here you, you can use our, our, our standard. Um, I think it's unfortunate they didn't do this 10 to 12 years ago. I think if they if they did it back in 2011, we might have a completely different landscape right now. I mean, I think you might see automakers like Aptera pick it up, maybe maybe a canoe or something like that. I don't know what their, their thoughts are. We all know Aptera wants to use it. It looks like yeah. they're getting the green light to use it now. Um, but, uh, you know, I just I, I wish that we could have this could have been 12 years ago because I think I think we would have a totally different uh, landscape now. There's definitely yeah. something behind it because we're about to talk to Kyle in four days time or 10 minutes depending on it, which way you look at it and um and and i know that uh, he just made a, a whole podcast about it and i've not had a chance to listen to it yet so he might have some insight on that but as you say the the federal money and some of the funds available are only for charging stations that are not closed down to one network because it would be crazy right. to have federal, federal money that pays for tesla superchargers right. so i wonder if somewhere in legalese in this whole thing where they go uh the the tesla connector there's no such thing my friends it's called the north american charging standard and it's completely open now give us your money because <laughs> like that genuinely they're like the sorry the tesla connector no there's no such thing no 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 that's an it's, we use an open standard so i don't know like this could be a genius chess move or genuinely it could just be because they want other people to use it but as you say tom no one will and i when i say no one uh, let me qualify that no one uh, of any substance or means to make a reasonable amount of vehicles now you might get as you say an aptera or uh and you know what's some of the smaller canoe. ones fair to future Can, canoe are flying around uh is is what's it called uh, it, oh i'm gonna get that wrong is it electro mechanica um some of these mechanica up in canada mm -hmm. are they uh, some yeah, of the, the ones solo that, and the duo. Yeah, they've actually got to market. They're small makers, you know. They've yeah. actually done the, the hard yards and got a vehicle to market. They're not selling bazillions of them, but no. they're more than vaporware. Like whether they hope that that will catch on. But what's in it for Tesla in that? Apart from, if somebody else uses it, they can say, "Hey, it's the North American charging standard. Give us, give, give us, give us your bucks." <laughs> I don't Basically, know. Yeah. I just, I, I just wish they had done this ten years ago. But yeah. that wasn't. If you if you rewind ten years ago when Tesla was fighting to to exist, right, week in week out or month in month out, it was very much a siege mentality. It was Tesla versus the world. It was Tesla versus the auto industry. And yeah, they had deals with Toyota and and Mercedes Benz, and and some of those kept the company going. And uh, at the time, and they needed to do those um, those contracts. But very very much so. Apart from those, it was. A fight for survival and the last thing on their mind was hey let's do something good for the good of the community um but it could that could have been a genius move 10 years ago because we'd all be using a much 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 better plug than what we you know than what we ended up with yeah it's, it's so much better to use i, I really wish that i kind of well i really wish i kind of wish the oems would look seriously at but it would be it's such not, a huge inexpensive mess to not like, straighten it out now it's like it's not yeah. happening Right. Not, uh, it was a shame it, too because it's so much better god so i can't imagine better. it happening and and you know if anybody is 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 doesn't believe that like you know tesla's patents weren't open i mean that you, you just by this the fact that they're saying okay look now you can use them proves that they weren't open and and i have a little experience attached. with this back yeah. in back in 2017 i was at ces and um, I had an invitation from ChargePoint. They were they were announcing their new uh, ChargePoint Express 250s, the, the the DC fast chargers. And I was on the floor the first day, like one of the first ones. The floor was empty, and I remember making a beeline to to ChargePoint so I could get some pictures before all the people came of the these new DC fast chargers. And uh, don't 2017 spot six years ago, pretty pretty much now. Yeah. We're gonna have 2018 uh, 2023 CES in a, in a week or so, and. As soon as I got to the site, I noticed there was a charge point home, home charging station with a Tesla connector on it. I couldn't believe it. You know, so I took a picture of it and put it on Instagram. And I was like, didn't expect to see this here today. And uh, then uh, an hour later, I walked around the hall. I came back and now it's gone. 
So I'm asking everybody, where's the, the Tesla connector? You know, the Tesla thing. Nobody would talk to me. But I had friends at, at ChargePoint. I had some of the people that I knew. And I got one of them pulled me aside and said, Tom, Tesla saw your, your Instagram post. They called us up and they ordered us to take it off the floor immediately. And I was I like, like that up for you. you know, yeah, oh, yeah, you did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah there is that, you, is you, that you the did. one? Yeah, that, that's it right there. That's me yeah. holding holding it. And um, I just thought it was cool. Now, you notice no other charging station company has ever made a charger with a Tesla connector on it. I have 50 of them here in, in, in my uh, garage, and none of them have a Tesla. Don't you think that all of these companies would love to sell a, 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 a charger with, with a Tesla connector on it? For crying out loud, Tesla dominates yes. the market here in North America. Of course yes. they would make one with it. But they weren't allowed to. So right. you know this. This all our patents are yours. You know that 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 was not the case, guys. It, it just simply is just fallacy. This is, so does this mean that now that third third parties can make Tesla home chargers? It seems that way. Okay, because that could that could be something. I mean, because they they would make it, they would under undercut Tesla's price. I would imagine. And, well, uh, is that is that? I don't know if they can. Tesla sells them really, oh, really? at low price. I think yeah. Tesla like makes yeah. pennies on their units. It's okay. kind of like just a you know, almost a service to their to to their customers because yeah. their their charging equipment um, is in, is priced incredibly competitively. I believe they didn't open all the patents either. They they kept no. some. I believe they kept and, some things for themselves as well. And I think some of them might have been open source because I think when I put this online and said okay. I, had, I, I had no idea, I had Tesla fans come back and go, oh, but some of them are like there are right. some bits that Tesla go, oh well, you, you know, this is now open source. Anyone can use it. So I think it's a. It's a sliding scale of stuff as well. It's not It's not black and white. So that'd be fascinating to see a bunch of home chargers turning up with this, whether they have to put the Tesla branding on, whether it's like the certified um, Apple thing, whether where everyone who makes an Apple cable and sells it on Amazon, you then have to pay a few cents to, uh, to Tim Apple. Uh, we'll wait and see. <laughs> we'll wait and see. So I guess... You're not going to let that die, are you? No, I love it. <laughs> So now we have to ask Kyle what he thinks about this. Hey, and welcome hey. back. Are we oh, all we muted? Go. All right. Seamless. Absolutely seamless. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So Kyle, so what what are your thoughts? And welcome from uh, from your mo model th a model three in the, the, the wilds of Nor Norway. I guess you're right. Yep, I'm in the Arctic Circle. I've lost my voice, so excuse the sound here it's been nope. terrible filming when i can't talk uh, <laughs> not covid though so right. here's the thing um i am a bit more pro than all of you guys on this whole thing now everyone accuses me of being a tesla fanboy on one side the other side thinks i hate tesla i try and be as objective as possible i think um when we get into like what the actual connector means it's a nicer connector than CCS without question. It slides in easier. It's easier to handle. It's a really nice unit. The thing is, this isn't the saving grace that everyone's hoping for. If we all decide to retrofit the cars, the chargers, everything with the Tesla handle, it's still going to be communicating on the same protocol. Nearest makes no difference as CCS, which is different than what Tesla uses for the superchargers. And it's not going to solve any of the back end payment or really the op interoperability issues that we're seeing out in the wild. This is purely about physically connecting a handle. So it should open up the superchargers uh, for use for other vehicles, which I think is a huge benefit. It works really well here in Europe. We've been loving it. I charged her, it was great. Um, love that feature. The thing is, is it gonna happen? Does it mean anything? Is it vaporware? I think, yes, total vaporware until one automaker uses it. And I'm not talking about a small automaker like Aptera or Canoe. That doesn't really matter. I'm talking about when Ford or Daimler, which I think the Germans will be last to switch. But if we see a Ford do this or a Rivian do this, okay, then it that's when we really need to pay attention. Just takes one. As soon as one does it, then I think the domino effect will happen. What about wow. the idea of home chargers that Dom raised? Is that a possibility rather than thinking about it in terms of DC fast charging, that it opens up the market for a bunch of uh, equipment makers to then make their version of a Tesla connector or a Tesla charger? Is that a market that's that's opening up? 
yeah, I mean, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Home charging isn't, um, it, it isn't like the units are very expensive. It isn't like they're complicated to make. And every Tesla comes with an adapter anyway. So I don't know. I Sure, we'll see them on the market. I don't think that's really game changing for anyone, though. The big news for me is, okay, as soon as we can get this form factor in an existing automaker's company, then in their cars, then, then, then I think it's game over. It's just a matter of time until everyone uses the standard. And the thing, the, there's the, things I like about it beyond just the form factor. Sorry, it's that there's no current limitation. You can run as much current as you want through this thing up to a thousand volts, and they're like, it's just dropping out a bit. The, the 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 CCS standard is uh, governed and developed by Charin, which is the trade organization of which I think there's maybe a thousand members or something. You know, everyone from Bosch, who's a part supplier to the automotive industry, um, all the way through to the German manufacturers. But from what I understand, someone correct me. I think that the German OEMs, uh, you know, in other words, own the CCS standard. So I can't see them ever going to a Tesla connector unless you're literally in a market where someone's not going to buy your car unless it has the Tesla connector. So I can't see anyone who's part of the Charon organization and Tesla are a member of Charon, by the way. Um, I can't see them moving away from it. So uh, Andre, we know that uh, Tesla, use, and welcome to the show, Andre. Uh, oh, hello. <laughs> Uh, we know we know that Tesla uses CCS over in Europe, but uh, do you have any thoughts on on the Tesla North American charging standard as for as well? Well, yeah, I, I'm with Kyle on this. To be honest, I think that the, the the Tesla connector is probably the best one on the market. That's why other automakers are trying to get in on the action. I I, I know of Aptera, and I'm pretty sure Bollinger Motors also tried to uh, to uh, make that their charger. So yeah, I think that it's a, it's a good move. Standardization in this respect is very good, and it should be imposed maybe even more. Right, man. I I don't know what OEM would would actually you know take that big. That's a big step, and I don't know which OEM would do it. But I think um, you know it's, for the user experience is just so much better because it's a one hand thing. Not everybody has can use both hands or has lots of strength. I mean, this we're talking a huge population span from you know like the 16, 17 year old to people in their you know nineties drive cars and you know and some people have disabilities. So that's just one of those things that the the Tesla connector would, would make everything everything so much easier. But again, we don't know if we can get another OEM to pick it up. Yeah, but you know, Dominic, the first OEM to include this adapter, whether it's a paid option, whether it's standard on their vehicles, a couple things need to happen. And we've done two really in-depth podcasts on our podcast channel about this. The oh, first is right. there needs to be a backwards compatible uh, Tesla CCS adapter so that right, their yeah. previous model years will have access to all of the superchargers. The next thing that needs to happen is um, or I should say, really, the, the first automaker who's going to do this is the one who's customer centric. No customers are saying we love CCS. No one's saying that. It's just the car companies that are saying we love CCS because we put all this time and effort into this standard. And that's fine. But I think the first one who decides to do this will get a huge wave of love and purchases and excitement from the user base which ultimately yeah. is who these companies should be trying to serve. Right. And the CCS connector, when, as, as Dom just mentioned, I've used a couple of them recently on the high-powered chargers that have got all of the liquid cooling in the cable as well. And some of those cables, if it's really cold, can get, get a bit stiff. And, you know, honestly, like, I'm not the biggest strong man in the world, but, and I'm thinking, these cables are really pretty heavy and the connector and if, if you haven't parked perfectly there's no kind of bending the cable around like you used to be in the old days like oh stretch it a bit and you know kink the cable in Th there is some accessibility issues here around ccs in terms of those are now very very heavy if you have accessibility issues as don mentioned it, it, it's quite this is actually a really serious point those are not easy cables to plug in the tesla connector is far more elegant i can't believe i'm calling a plug elegant yeah, but but the cables is, won't change it's just the connector. Yeah, but that's if people use adapters. And then I think the long-term game plan surely has to be, 
what if any car can turn up to a Tesla supercharger in North America? So if all of a sudden Aptera are using the Tesla, because th there's two parts, isn't there? There's the, there's the plug and the socket. So if you are a car maker and you go all in on both, then you can use Tesla supercharging network. Now, you're over here in Europe at the minute. That is a, that's a moot point. Everything here is CCS. But that's really interesting that Tesla still has, it was 78% of the US market. It's now 73% of the US market of new EV sold. That's still unheard. You know, if they get into double figures over here, that's unheard of. So I, I try to remind myself, actually, it's a much bigger deal in, in the US than it is over here in terms of Tesla. But yeah, I can't see anyone switching to the both the plug and the socket. The adapters thing is interesting, but I think like the, the all round play of selling new cars with that socket on would be really interesting. So um, this is not going to, nothing's going to change overnight and there's still some time for this. And uh, so let's, let's switch to some, what we've been driving. Um, and because we're a little, a little short on time this week. So Kyle, you're in Scandinavia and you're driving it. You're in a Tesla model three, I believe. And it just got an update. Uh, real quick, I mean, this Model Three is it a is that an LFP pack from Germany? No, nope, it's a performance one. Oh, okay. So it's something that you're very used to. Any any differences? Uh, no, the car is it's not a brand new one. It's got thirty thousand miles. It's okay. a heat pump car, but it doesn't have the heated steering wheel. It's not a brand new one. Okay. Um, yeah. So. I see. I'm not sure. You haven't driven a whole lot of things on this trip yet, but you did do the uh, you did do a 70 mile an hour range test of the Volkswagen ID Buzz. Oh, yeah. I'm not sure if you're going to catch up with us here. He's frozen. Uh, we can move on to Andre right now and wait for him to come back. That's what Kyle's been driving. <laughs> yeah. Just while we That's just while we wait. Bad. That's what's here. and Marcus oh. Marcus Beal. If you watch Bjorn Newland's videos in in Norway, you'll you'll know that name very well. Um, so uh, so yeah. yeah, that's what you've been driving uh, from Marcus Beal. Yep. Sorry about the delay. Marcus loaned us this car. Been wonderful. We're actually deep in the Arctic Circle in a town called Alta, Norway, right now just about 10 minutes away from a supercharger, heading all the way up to North Cape to the northernmost drivable road. Okay. Have you seen the Northern Lights yet? Uh, we have not this trip, last Norway trip. We have hopefully tonight. The, it's okay. looking pretty good for us. Sweet. Yeah, we're wow. kind of looking forward to seeing some pictures or some video of that because yeah, Northern Lights are awesome. That's it. Um, yep. but, but you also mentioned the ID Buzz. Yeah. And that yeah. also drove the Neo et7 and did Ooh. the battery swap which was really interesting okay so i saw ET, you tried it seven is the big suv right no nope, it's the Sedan. model X oh okay so that's the model s version so the and then the one. battery yeah you can save some money on the purchase price i think it's 169 euros a month or around that and get the battery swap if you buy the battery you can't get access to battery swapping um you can't just sort of opt into it if you you know for one time um what did you think of it how easy was it so it didn't work at all. <laughs> we had from being battery swapped. Yeah. Oh no. So I, I think you said. Am I back now? No, don't worry. We 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 got you. We we partially got you. Well, that's yeah. really interesting. Yeah. That, it, that it just didn't it just didn't work. And and whereabouts was that? Was that in? Was that Neo in Germany or Neo in uh, Norway? That was Neo in Norway. So we borrowed the ET7 and. I think I'm going to try and borrow another one before I leave. Uh, the problem really was that the car was a media car. It wasn't actually hooked up to their battery swap program, even though we borrowed uh, it under the premise of the battery swap. So that didn't really work out so well. Uh, right. But then it also had a driver assistance fault where it uh, wouldn't have automatically driven in anyway. So there was multiple things stopping it from working. Um, but the car itself, solid, really nice car dog mode so quiet excuse my voice it was incredible a big neo fan that car turned me into a neo lover awesome uh and how would you compare it to like the bmw i7 which you were raving about last week would you which i oh, you know nowhere near as much car but also much less okay. expensive right um, right right you, know, it's, it does, you cannot compare this to the i7 that is german refinement at its at its best uh, okay. But it is quiet. It's it, the seating position is really bad in this car. You sit really high up, in my opinion. But it was quick. Um, it has some like weird oddities. It's like the Chinese approach building a car so differently than anyone else that you just get weird stuff. 
For example, you can choose your power level by zero to 60 time. So you can choose 3.8 seconds, like four, five, six, seven, nine, and 12 seconds, zero to 60. It like makes no sense, but it's great. <laughs> That's chill, chill mode. Oh my God. Um, yeah, and the crazy part is like, if you put it in comfort mode, it goes to the slowest acceleration. It, it literally makes no sense. So at least you can configure your own drive mode, but right. really a wonderful, wonderful car. The battery swap seems a bit silly, uh, but they, it doesn't charge that well because mm. on a road trip, the idea is that you use the battery swap and they're right. building a network. There's three installed in the Oslo area, a fourth going in just up the E6 north of Oslo. So it can work but they can only handle one car at a time. I think as these become more mass market, the battery swap will work less and less outside right. of China. Right. I think so, they opened like um, charging sta uh, swapping station number 1,200 in China recently. So that's pretty impressive. Wow, very impressive. I think their right. target is 1,500 by, if not the end of this year, very soon as well. What I think, it, what is impressive is their target outside of China. Uh, which I'm not sure they've always shared, but I have seen them sharing it recently. And that is uh, a sign of big expansion, whether you can go to the shops and buy one of these cars, uh, you know, immediately in your country or not. Same as BYD and Xpeng. Try and read the tea leaves of what they're saying. And when you look at how much money they're spending in battery swapping in Europe, that means that they've got big, big plans. So it's interesting. How did the software, how did the software translate in terms of from Chinese to, to usable English? Um, actually pretty good and Nomi worked pretty well in English. I think it's had some major updates. Nomi's that's the, that's the little uh, control thing that you can see at the top of the screen there. Yeah, it's way too interesting. The little face. I mean, I'm not going to lie. I do get the impression that like everything in this car was recorded and then looked at after we had it. <laughs> <laughs> I would not be surprised. I mean, it wouldn't shock me. I mean, I mean there are privacy laws though in Europe, they, you know. I think the Chinese don't don't care about that stuff, Dominic. <laughs> so they just it's it's all wide open. And you do get that impression driving the car. It's just a bit okay. You just have to let it go. So, you know, I don't know. I thought Nomi was a little weird and annoying and it moves around so much and the motors make too much oh, really? noise. Okay. Yeah. So you hear it zoom, zoom, zoom on the dash. And it's just like <laughs> turn it off, just rip that thing out of there. But other than that, really nice. I actually met the guy who Years ago, I met the guy who created Nomi, and it's Correct. like a big deal in China. You yeah. buy Nomi accessories to run your life in your house. So Neo knows everything about their customers, I guess. But but back to being serious, they the car was so good. But you know what's even better is the ID Buzz, just because it's happy. Yeah, but let's the talk ID about the ID Buzz. <laughs> has no range, no range. It's so inefficient. Oh my God, Why? really? Well, it's got, it's got oh, in, in Europe, it's got the 77 kilowatt hour battery. Yeah, but that's still okay. So that's I still now happening. know why we're, yeah, I now know why we are only getting the big battery long wheelbase in the U.S. Because this thing okay. went less than 160 miles at 70 Ooh. miles an hour. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah, that stings, kilom actually. That does wow. sting a little bit. That is, but that is. To make up for it. It charges really well, and it takes okay. only about 50 minutes, 49 minutes to go dead to completely full. Ooh, so you can use good. a lot of that range. But well, you're, it's like a little good. bit of the Tron lifestyle. You're going to be doing deep charges, but it doesn't take that long to charge. No range remaining. Charge vehicle zero percent. That's <laughs> yes. Kyle. You are so hardcore. You just don't care. You're like, I'll go down to That's zero. Yeah, my goodness, this would give me nightmares for weeks. <laughs> All right, so uh, we should move on. Um, Andre, you ha you haven't been driving anything electric in the last couple of weeks, but you did drive the Jaguar F Pace 400e plug-in hybrid. Maybe you could give us like we have a bunch of news to go over real quick here, but maybe you could give us like the elevator ride highlights of that SUV. Well, it doesn't really matter how good it is because Jaguar is going to adopt a different strategy, like. So they are going to drop all their current models and um, they were going to drop all their current models and they even stopped development of the electric XJ, their big, fancy, big sedan, you know, the flagship sedan. 
Um, and now their, uh, their CEO has changed again and he might bring a new strategy to the company. So I think that me driving the, the F-Pace plug-in hybrid could be a segue to talking about that because Jaguar is fairly important in Europe and people know it and they know it in, in America as well. But um, yeah, that interior is super nice. Um, but I think that I, I really hope that the brand doesn't die because, um, well, they don't do very well in terms of sales. And um, yeah, that, that's what I wanted to talk about more so than, you know, the car itself, Bec sure. which, which is fine. It's It, it costs 100,000 euros. So you expect it to be good. Yeah. It has like 30 miles electric range, 400 horsepower. Um, it pumps in V8 sounds through the speakers, even though it's a four cylinder. It's super plush and luxurious. The infotainment is very, very good because it's Land Rover's latest. It's the latest software and it's really, really good. And I like the look of it, but it doesn't really matter, I think, because Jaguar is going to change course again, as I said. And Jag right. decided to put a CCS Combo 2 plug on the side of it. So with your 30 miles of range, you can quite happily go and clog up a nice DC fast charger. You can, you, you go, can, yeah, yeah. Go and have lunch for half an hour and annoy all the EV drivers. I did. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah, did great. That. Thanks a lot for that, Jaguar. Just stick an AC plug on it. But, you know, not the only ones to do that. It's still unnecessary on a plug-in hybrid that does 30 miles. 100 miles. I, I, I got like story. I got 52 kilometers of um, EV range. So that translate let, let me just break out the miles. 52 uh, 52 kilometers km to miles. Um so 32 miles. 32 That's what I got in the miles. real world, which is pretty good, I think. Mm. For a 17.8 kilowatt hour, 17.1 kilowatt hour battery pack. In a vehicle that is. size, yeah, that's, that's not so bad. That. There it is. Yeah, it's it's over two two tons. It's 2.1 tons. It's really big. Yeah. And right. you know what? Well, for, for some people, this may be, for some people, this may be the it's perfect a transitional vehicle. vehicle. Like if you, if you do uh, a 30 mile round trip and you drive carefully uh, and you go to work and back and that's 20 or 30 miles and you, and you can charge at home then or, or even charge at work if they offer that for free at your workplace then you'll do you'll save so much petrol money and then you do occasional long journeys it's great i think i think the f-pace styling wise has has held up well i think it still yeah, looks nice um have they put the new have they put the uh, I pay steering wheel on that, or is that has it always been like that? Because the steering wheel looks different to me. It is different. I'm not sure if it's the exact one from the I pace, but it is different to the F pace that I drove in like 2016 or something, and that had a much lower quality interior. Oh, by the way, this is the revelation with this vehicle. I I forgot yeah. to mention it. It's the interior is of so much better quality and much nicer and much well much better put together. Yeah. So, look for some people who are just do not want to buy an electric vehicle, then this this could well be this could well be the car. Uh, I actually asked them. Jaguar for an iPace to to review because I've actually <laughs> never driven one, but they didn't have one, and they probably aren't going to have one in the in the press fleet here anytime soon. No, there's right. no focus. I had one straight from the factory two years ago this month. Uh, yeah, it was it was December December two years ago, and that was with the update. That was with the new software and updated as well, uh, and it was box fresh. Had about 16 miles off the boat, um, and it is such a tremendous performance vehicle that I that's that's the thing that I forget about the iPace is much more of a performance vehicle than the e-tron which is is it I, as good to drive as they say yeah very much so and i put it in my mind i put it up there with e-tron eqc i-pace and it's not the i-pace is a really great driver's vehicle mm -hmm. with so much performance and uh, and a, it's a great chassis and it's such it's such an anomaly for me and that they just built just magna built this one thing yeah it, it is built by magna and that's yeah, what made it's it pretty good clear. plus the jaguar heritage and all the very positive reviews saying how well it drives they've made me really curious i really really want to try it out i hope i get the mm. chance all right so we have a bunch of new cars and stories to discuss from uh, la auto show and uh, a few other things but so we'll keep most of these pretty short but let's kick this off with a draco dragon so uh this is the second vehicle from draco which is a company founded by dean draco and shiv sikand in late 2013 the first vehicle was the gte grand tour which uh will offer up 1200 horsepower for 100 for 1.25 million dollars and it's based on the fisker karma which is kind of a head scratcher so the dragon will be a much better value um only 290 thousand dollars 
only, but 2000 horsepower, which is as much horsepower, I think, as I've seen anywhere. And like the GTE, it has four motors powering it and it will go over 200 miles an hour. It, however, is built on a carbon fiber chassis for a human, uh, for a huge weight savings and twice the structural rigidity, they claim, of a traditional SUV. Uh, it's supposed to be built in the U.S. from 2026, and they hope to produce 5,000 a year. Andre, they appear to have built actual vehicles, and both founders have like a master's of science in electrical engineering, so they, they have an idea of what they're doing here. Um, it's a incredible were... product, I th at least from the looks of it. Right. But it's too early to tell, I think. So if you were a man of extraordinary means, would you consider putting down a $5,000 deposit for one of the first 99 first edition vehicles? Sure. If it's good enough off-road to justify the, the, the higher ground clearance, the, the ride height, I mean, yeah, definitely. I want to see it go off-road and then I'll make my mind up. Oh, really? You think an SUV needs to go off-road? Yeah, otherwise just get a sedan or a wagon or a hatchback. That's true. That's like, <laughs> and that's a, just that's really like the more it's sensible advice. Is it, that's kind of like the Euro European mindset too, right? I think more absolutely to a degree because I think people here are more into SUVs than they used to be, and the trend is increasing. More and more people are buying SUVs. Look at that scoop. At the look at the way that they right. designed for the aero. It's uh, a bit like the what was it? The charger had that. The charger does um, that. There's a uh, something else. Air goes through. The Polestar Three has something like that, but less extreme. Yep. That's yeah. the same. You know, this is it's interesting a... that they want to go all carbon fiber. They want to go two thousand horsepower, which is I don't even know what that means anymore. Not uh, sixty and one point nine seconds. Yeah. yeah. So, which well, you get to anything around two seconds, not to sixty, and you're, you're traction limited. And so, if you right. start talking about not to sixty or drag times, it's completely traction limited. So, you get to the point of you're spending three hundred thousand on this, then you want bragging rights of it'll be any combustion supercar. Um, styling wise, I think it looks great. Interesting, they've built one. Maybe they've built two. We don't know, uh, or yeah. more. But they, it's not renders. Think about how many car right. companies over the years. God, we've talked about it on this podcast uh, almost weekly. Uh, you, you know, uh, here's a new product, and here's a yeah. concept car, and here's a render of it. And now give us your money. You know, they've actually built one. Whether it's whether you, go, I don't know, roll it downhill. I don't know. Trevor would be proud, or whether it moves under its own steam. Who <laughs> knows? But just look how cool it is. Gullwing doors, no B pillar. It just looks brilliant and awesome and fantastic. And, and if, you know, if you're in the market for a $300,000 uh, car, this is, I don't know, this is your fifth, sixth, seventh car in the garage. So you can probably just put a deposit down and forget you ever spent that $5,000. Uh, Will they bring this to market? Can they do it? You know, man, I don't know. Man. It's hard I mean, to we, say. We've seen difficulties from the likes of Rivian, Lucid. You know, they're making thousands of cars a year at the minute. Um, okay, so in the, in you know, uh, maybe four times that or five times that. But Lucid, funded by the Saudis, massive IPO. They're not short of money and they're struggling. So right. for Draco, yeah. Draco, this seems hard, but it seems brilliant. And I hope they get there. Right. So let's move right along. I don't know. Actually, Kyle, did you want to say anything about this? I have a feeling. Yeah. Right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, so that's cool. So Look the how uh, premium it is. Oh wow! Sorry, I'll shut up. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not. You know, it didn't really bowl me over the inside. I'm just like, mm. even it's the Ferrari esque in, way, in, in the steering wheel looks like a Ferrari mm. steering wheel somewhat. Right, or Lamborghini Euros. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Or, or, or yeah, or or, or Euros. Yeah. Um, yeah, the Euros is kind of what I think of when I when I look at that the overall design, but. Um, so the Toyota Prius has been around since 1997, and now a new generation has debuted at the LA Auto Show. It's got more performance and power than the outgoing model, which it desperately needed, uh, but it's still only available as a hybrid or a plug-in hybrid uh, with a premium Prius Prime badge. The battery has been increased from 8.8 .8 kilowatt hours to 13.6 kilowatt hours, zero to 60 time reduced from over 10 seconds to a zippy 6.6 .6 seconds. Andre, you estimate you estimated in the post you wrote it up that the EPA range is to be about thirty six point five miles. Is that enough for a plug in hybrid in twenty twenty three? And what do you think? Uh, and and do you think this is a look that will bring in buyers? I think it's enough for a plug in hybrid, definitely. But I don't think people will go for the plug in hybrid at least in in uh, in the. In, your, uh, in the states, sorry, yeah, in states, okay, because, because you can get the regular hybrid with all-wheel drive, and I think that might interest a lot of people. True, that's a very More. good point. I think that's the the biggest change, aside from the the styling, which is 
pretty good for a Prius. But the fact that you can get it with all wheel drive and it's considerably more powerful than before, I think it might bring it to a, a bring it to the attention of different kinds of buyers, let's say. So uh, it's interesting looking at this side profile. I just want to say really quick, it kind of reminds me of a lot of the, it's changed so much the styling, but it still has that basic Prius kind of look that windshield is like one flat piece of glass and that whole plane from the tip to it's the- It's a very low rake, isn't it? I, I like the yeah. rear end. It looks a lot like the Mirai, I think. And in a good way, I like the rear end of the Mirai as well. I think it's right. nicely proportioned. Um, so Martin, you're, you've been a, a pretty fierce critic of, of, uh, Toyota and it's, uh, you know, it's marketing over the last while. Uh, what are your thoughts on the Prius? We don't need to spend a whole lot of time on this, but I did want to get your thoughts. Oh, so, uh, I have been, uh, critical of Toyota, but not because they don't make great cars and they, they, they do make great cars is because of the amount of money they spend. Uh, going out of their way uh, to anti-EV advertise, like running commercials on social media uh, to say, we choose not to plug in with sad looking plugs. They've had commercials with a guy standing in the middle of the desert holding a, a charge plug into his all electric you know, generic car, no brand EV, uh, while a Prius sp speeds by in the middle of the desert. They have spent a fortune trying to kill electric vehicles they spend untold amounts of money trying to tell you that plugging in is bad and then they come back and go oh we made a plug-in hybrid oh and uh and we also made the bz a b c d e f g and it's like what what do you want me to believe toyota because it's a global economy now and you can't pull the wool over our eyes anymore you can't advertise one thing here and one thing here and talk out both sides of your mouth and think we won't notice so what do you want to do do you want to make evs or not make evs uh, I don't care. Like I, I don't own any Toyota stock. Doesn't I don't lose any sleep at night. But they go out of their way to hate on EVs, and then they make one. And then what do you want us to say about it? Well, you made a plug-in hybrid. Congratulations. Actually, the styling of the car, uh, the way it looks, I think is is pretty neat. I think externally it yeah. looks cool. Uh, I think this is the best looking Prius they've ever made. I think it almost looks sporty. That 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 roof line it peaks such a long way back. It sort of almost looks. Like rearward bias, like a sports car. That long rake of the of the bonnet, the back has kind of got something Honda-ish about it. I'm not quite sure why. Um, and I think it actually looks amazing. Uh, I, I just wish that they'd gone the route of of offering a bunch of powertrains for this vehicle, regardless of what you want. So offer a mild hybrid if that's what you want. Offer a plug-in right. hybrid if that's what you want. Offer a full electric Prius. I would do that. I think the name Prius is really strong. Offer a full electric Prius. And then you can choose your flavor and and stop stop spending so much money trying to hold back the the move to clean green transport. You know they they are the biggest spender of uh, of automakers in in the U.S. lobbying against the move to zero emissions. They spend untold amounts of money to hold us back. So. What do you want me to say about their plug-in car? I wouldn't buy it. You couldn't pay me to drive one of these, but I think it looks pretty cool. <laughs> well, luckily, I think a lot of people will, will like it because the the, uh, the Prius has like a sort of, you know, it's a kind of a touch. It was a huge hit in like uh, the late 2000s, early 2010s. And, you know, it's I think its popularity has waned somewhat over the time, especially with all these new electric cars coming. Its performance was still, you know, 20 years ago not great mediocre performance so it really needed this update but kyle what's i need to want to get some of your thoughts on this real quick well actually disagree about the performance i thought it was fine i've yeah. i've been reluctantly a prius fan i okay. love them they're practical they can take all the abuse in the world they actually handle pretty well when you drive them hard i've done track days in pre i i raced one against a ferrari once uh, for a video <laughs> and, um, yeah, taking them on road trips, like they're great. And, um, yeah, this one just seems to be same story, new shape. I didn't think it was that big of news, but everyone's talking about it. Yeah, no, it's, it's kind of a big deal. It's, it's a lot more sporty. And they mentioned it too, they've lowered the, the hip point in the car. So it, it, you sit lower, you, it's a sportier feel for the but driver as well. Dumb because cars need to stop getting sporty. We okay. have enough sporty cars. We need comfortable cars. Right. We need cars that are easy to get in and out of. Things that cruise nicely. Maybe it's because 
I'm sick and I'm not feeling great. And I just want to be in a more comfortable car than this model three, but uh, like no one's buying a Prius for sport. I mean, Kyle, I know you had a birthday, but are you all 60 years old now? (laughs) (laughs) I just think like not everything. I think cars get ruined because they try and be more sporty. I thought the Prius third gen, which was like 2010 era, that's right. still peak Prius. Right. And that if was the most one popular the, selling one too. Yeah, you could get the five with tech pack. It had adaptive cruise, looked pretty good, cruise pretty nice. Yeah. This yeah, is I, the James May argument. You know, you take a car around the Nurburgring and you automatically ruin it. It's it's somewhat true unless you want a performance car. Right. And then go all out. Right. I, I kind of I kind of agree. I thought about that this perspective when you're you know, when I was reading the lowering the hit point, I'm like, is that really what the Prius needs? I don't know. I mean, I like I pre- appreciate the zero to sixty in the pep in traffic. I mean, that's great. Oh, sure. We'll take all the acceleration, but yeah, that doesn't takes, mean forty. Right. And you know, and the looks it's like the last design was so fussy with all the lines. I kind of liked it, but it was you know really out there and obviously didn't do anything for sales. Um yeah, you'd hope that with no binnacle around that driver's display, there's some sort of matte treatment to stop it glaring, because that's quite a long way towards. It's almost a head-up display. It's a long way back towards the windscreen. Although it's a very uh, steep it's... rake on the windscreen, it's a long way away from from you, and there's nothing surrounding it, so the sun's going to hit that. But um, yeah, you have this little to... coating on that that you could that you're not going to glare off of it. Um, but it looks cool. Look at the massive screen inside it. And, you know, that's that's going to be interesting when your Uber driver chooses the radio station you want. Right. <laughs> because that, that's the only time you're going to be in one of these. The, the driver's screen is kind of similar to the BZ4X, I think, Kyle. But you, I, don't, I think, Kyle, you said you didn't like that far forward uh, thing in the BZ4X. Did I not like it? I was just trying to think about what I thought about it. <laughs> but I don't remember glare. That doesn't right, come right. to memory. Well, it's easy for X. It's got those two kind of side panels, you know, got you know, leading to the panel. To... Oh, that's right. Yeah, I'm not totally sure if I remember what I thought about the BZ Four X's yeah. screens. All I remember was how slow it charged. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, oh, I and think... that was that that was backed up by a Norwegian website, Elbil Twenty Four dot No. Um, they did uh, they did a charge test on the bz4x and and had to a bit like you uh they have a a, a set test a 70 mile and a range test they have a 0 to 100 test a bit like uh, Bjorn newland like tom and so uh they they had to do their test twice because they, they thought they'd done it wrong once on dc once on ac uh because toyota had told them there was a 71.4 kilowatt hour battery and both times they got just over 60 kilowatt hours into the battery and they're like Hang on, we've gone 150 kilometers less than you told us we would. So maybe the car was faulty, or maybe the battery's got a 60 kilowatt hour battery. I don't know. So, yeah, I think it sounds like the car did work as designed. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and when it gets to 80, percent it went down to eight kilowatts. Yep, and just that's sat normal. there at like eight, or was it that's 12? What we're supposed to do <laughs> for the last 20 percent, like two 90... hours to get to full. What? Yeah, I think it was 93 percent. It goes to one kilowatt. <laughs> It's I just so sit bad. there all day getting hundred percent. But could but it have like a ten kilowatt hour buffer? You know, yeah, but between... you never get idle fees. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it just keeps charging. Yeah, I don't know what the buffer could be on it. I don't know. It's it's got a huge buffer. We could have it be a story that... or more. That's yeah, what it, it sounds like. It is on the BZ4X. I mean, they might just be terrified of battery deg and warranty claims. Right. So they're just really protecting it. Oh, well. Andre, you wrote up a story, right, for Inside EVs. We just published this morning, I believe, about the dis- the uh, the buffer in in the uh, in this in the BZ4X. I presumed it could be the buffer. That was my um, ah. informed guess. That right, right, um, all right. So, uh, so for, Toyota also revealed a BZ compact SUV that looks pretty close to production on the outside at at the LA Auto Show. So we actually saw some angles of this car last December when it was one of the 15 that Toyota showed off to convince the world that it was really going electric. Uh, we don't have any specs or anything, but I thought we should at least mention it and maybe bring it up on the screen to show it. Um, since it seems like this is likely the next EV to come from Toyota, I don't know if anyone wants to jump in and say whether or not, oops, <laughs> or say whether or not they, they love or uh, hate this. We'll see, we'll 
see if I can find a, a picture of this thing. There you go. Sorry. Yeah, yep, that's right. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, isn't that the same as one of the Chinese? Isn't it like, looks like the B Z3 for China? Right. Maybe I'm and thinking it, of the wrong thing. It looks like it could be a production car. Like, that's just one of the four they've announced to me. Like, right. Yeah, right. it's not a concept. Crack on and make it. Right. They haven't, given, they haven't assigned it a number like a BZ. Well, it should be. It looks like it's ready to go. X or I don't know what they're going to call it. Because they have the BZ3 already in China, but this is a subcompact. If you see it on the uh, the picture from last December, if you hmm. kind of look at it, it's right beside the BZ4X and it's noticeably shorter. So it's uh, it's uh, okay. going to be a pretty compact CUV. But anyway, I just thought I'd throw that out there and mention it. Uh, so we'll move right along unless somebody wants to say something else about it. No. Okay. So Lucid has debuted a number of tr different trim levels of its Air sedan, and now it's just introduced another. The Lucid Air Pure is the most efficient Lucid jet and also the most affordable, starting at 87400 plus shipping. For the rear-wheel drive version, there's also an all-wheel drive version starting at 929. It comes with the long-range pack, which has 18 battery modules uh, compared with 22 in the extended pack. Uh, still, it is said to travel 410 miles on a charge, which is plenty. And because of the smaller battery, you get a little bit more seat, leg, and uh, foot room in the rear. So, Kyle, you spend a lot of time in the Lucid Air. Is this the one to get? Uh, possible, yes. Uh, <laughs> we need to do some testing with it. And I think Lucid has, since we tested it, updated their software massively. So I'd love to get back in and give that a go because that was my main criticism of the car. And I think um, price-wise, the air makes more sense in the lower trims. The problem is I don't think you can spec the glass roof in the base trim, which right. it really needs the glass roof. Oh, yeah? Yep. Okay. It's. I think it would be too claustrophobic without it because uh -huh. the roof is so low um, for aero that like having the glass roof makes it feel like it's farther away from you. That was our takeaway in our test car. The one that we reviewed, we were like, oh boy, we you better make sure you get at least one with the glass roof. Right. All right. Um, Don, what was, the, what was the starting price for the Pure? For the Pure, it'd be 78, or sorry, 87,400 plus shipping. Like there's, there's an increasing amount of people buying cars at that value. So I'm not, yeah, but it's, it's, that's yeah. priced well. That's, that's where the good. car should be priced. That's that seems nice, reasonable. The problem is, I think you're going to need to go up to the touring to get one that's livable, in my opinion. Right. And so, what is the touring priced at? That I don't have that right in front of me, but I do know it's, it's more. It's you know, yeah. I think it's up to over like 110 ish or something. I don't know if someone can right, but then you're right in there with Model S long range, right? And so, okay, maybe that's starting to make a little bit of sense, right? Yeah. The um, touring is 107 400. Okay, yep. that's right. the one I think you should consider. Okay, that's that's a significant jump in price, but yeah, I but, mean, there's no such a, in my opinion, there's no right price for the wrong car, and not having a glass roof is, I think, I haven't sat in one without it, but I just can't imagine it being livable. Okay. And so um, it's more or less some people like glass roofs or don't. That's not really the point. It's just like having something that's not stuffed in your head. Well, I've, I'm a, I love the glass roofs, the way they look, the way they feel when you're inside. But driving your Tesla Model 3 performance with a glass roof in, in pretty warm days, I realized, man, it, it lets in a lot of heat. And it's, oh, it's, and it's got to hit the efficiency, that. right? Because you have to cool cool that. So that's why this thing is, this Lucid Air Air Pure is like so efficient because it doesn't have to balance for that as well but as the other But keep in thing. mind, this is EPA efficiency. And my understanding is Lucid ran a different test cycle than others. So we don't know the efficiency until we run it against other cars on the same day in the same test. Right. Okay. That's fair. So, um, so while we're on Lucid, they do have uh, they made a little other news this week with their Lucid Air Sapphire. That's the tri motor version, uh, definitely not the least expensive one. I believe it's probably the most expensive one, uh, twelve hundred horsepower. Uh, so basically, it was able to uh, 
do a zero to 60 in under two seconds. I'm not sure if that's what's the rollout or not. Um, zero to 100 in under four seconds and a quarter mile in under nine seconds and the top speed over 200 miles an hour. So that's pretty significant. Yeah, the car maker says Lucid Air Sapphire, zero to 60 in 1.89 seconds, zero to 100 in 3.87 seconds, top speed 205 miles an hour. Uh, that makes it one tenth of a second quicker to 60 miles an hour, maybe more than the Tesla Model S Plaid. But I, we'd like to see those on a drag strip. Just that, because... that would have been done on a prepped surface as well, surely. For for scientific purposes, we need to see <laughs> this in real life, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, and it, also this week in in Lucid News, the 2024 Gravity SUV promises more range than any other SUV. So they've been pretty quiet about their their SUV, the Gravity, coming out. Uh, I believe we'll probably see it next year, right? They'll have further information on the full Gravity lineup in early 2023 when reservations open. Uh, but they did give us a few more uh, bits of information about it, and that's on Inside of Ease. You can check that out there. But I just want to make mention that on the way through not too many pictures of this though unfortunately not the kind of pictures that you need like the full profile shot and everything to really decide there's just lots of arty angles of it so we'll wait right. for some more pickies right we did see some exterior shots of it when it was spotted outside testing like a, a couple of years ago i believe but uh yeah yeah doesn't even look like that much of an suv although we got a better shot Oh, that's nice. Yeah. Um, oh, bigger reclining chairs in the back. Yeah. Yeah, that could be interesting. I'll be like, yeah, I'm curious what they're going to do with this because an SUV has just so much more real estate inside, you know, to play around with. And, uh, you know, Lucid, Lucid is a new company and exploring, you know, what they can do that makes it differenti differentiate themselves from other uh, automakers. Right. So let's also move down our list here. So the 2023 Hyundai. Ionic 6 has made its U.S. debut with 340, 340 miles of estimated EPA range. Uh, I believe that's EPA range. Andre, you wrote that up. Uh, anything that we need to know about the Hyundai Ionic, Hyundai Ionic 6? No, it's pretty much the same car you can buy all around the world. The only difference are the um, reflectors and the, the amber turn signals that are always on in the headlights. I think it's right. identical otherwise. So we're gonna, we're going to get both single and dual motor versions, I guess. Yeah, and, and that's the the, and the possible performance model with like the powertrain from the similar to the Kia EV6 GT and the Ionic 5N. Right. So you're going to the there's going to be an Ionic 6N. Most likely, they've shown the the concept. You know, the what was right. it called? The RN22 or whatever it was called. Oh, that's right. What's the yeah. price of this? I think that's passed me by. Oh, really? Uh, maybe uh, it's in the article. I'm looking um, for the looking for the US price. Did they, get, they didn't give us the US price not yet. yet. They? They've oh, not okay. announced official pricing yet for the US. Okay, but it's going to be a bit more than the five, we think. It is more car, definitely, and it will be priced accordingly. I think it's a more um, it's a bigger car, so yeah, they're going to ask more. Right. So I think we might be looking at fifty grand possibly up to close to 50 grand maybe all right uh let's see what else we, we need to say oh the uh, fisker ocean officially entered production in graz austria uh, that's being made by magna and so often there's you know new new companies starting up uh we'd like to congratulate them on making the job one I'm not sure if Job One is actually really delivering the car, but they've built the first cars, so that's kind of a big, big step. And um, there's been a lot of um, uh, naysayers, and I'm raising my hand because I wasn't sure this was actually going to happen, make it to this step, and it has. So you know, big congratulations for me, uh, Kyle. I have some thoughts on the Fisker Ocean. I'm excited to test it. I don't yeah. know what to expect because, um, you know. We know it's going to be built well. It's built by Magna, but is the spec of chassis, drivetrain, its primary axle is the front axle, may not be setting it up for success, especially in a sporty way. So we have some questions. I have some questions going into this. Um, 
in terms of design and price, I think it's they nailed it. Um, it's it's really the the, the driving is going to be the big question mark for me. Magna right. have a uh, platform which I believe Fisker are using, but then Henrik also talked about how much IP Fisker have retained. Uh, for themselves. I'm not quite sure where that balance. I know that Magna had developed an EV platform, at least certainly more than just an e-axle. Um, I think they've done quite a lot of the work that Fisker then used, but I wasn't sure what he was meaning about, hey, we've got a bunch of the IP that is ours so we can move forward with more ranges and stuff. But it's a really sensible way of going about a, a startup company, going to a business like that to say, hey, you're good at making cars, make us a car, we're good at designing them. And that's what Henrik does. So, well, uh, it's, it, yeah, it's yeah. my understanding that this has more magna content than almost any other vehicle ever yeah yeah that's cool and, that, and look, that's a, that's a really right good about, thing you're right about the chassis sorry um remember that arc fox i drove it's yeah. not the same car underneath but there's a lot of uh i guess a lot of inspiration from that we can say okay the arc fox was is a magna built car magna builds that as well yes oh i did not realize that for some reason Hmm. So, uh, anyone remember off the top of their head what the ocean sells for? Because I remember it's a good price. Like it starts at thirty nine, but there's like no options on that. I, I think it's get... even lower than that, Martin. I think. Oh, it's really? Like Thirty seven, eight hundred or something. That's why they the wanted to end up... one, the front wheel yeah. drive one. They yeah. wanted to build it. They want to find a way of building the follow up in North America to get access to the the, the new tax credit but because like, i think when they announced the pricing it was going to be a less than 30 grand suv because that was based two years ago on the the old tax tax credit rules but i mean that's still a heck of a price I, you won't get one next year it won't be the launch edition they're all sold out anyway but um wow if you just want the if you want a vehicle to get you around and you can get a base spec one delivered soonish in the next year then that's stellar value uh I'm looking at their website. Oh, I see one. Thirty-seven four ninety-nine is the cheapest one I see here. Wow, I got no options at all on it. But well, you might not care. It's good. It's a front wheel, single motor, front wheel drive, two hundred fifty miles of range. That suits uh, me, honestly. Like the MG suits my wife. She loves it. It's just right. that that style, that SUV shape, gives her confidence in traffic. Right. It's got parking assist, central touchscreen, sky, big sky roof. Fisker Premium Sound app is key. So it's cruise control. Well, cruise control. Everything's got cruise control. You guys, well, oh. they 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 don't have a bunch of the, the, of those features at the start. So that's well, that's yeah, the deal. You, I guess a lot's coming down the road. But do you know yeah. if they're building the base one at start of production? I no. know I can call some friends at Magna. But <laughs> I don't, know. I don't I believe they are. I believe <laughs> yeah. After they get through the launch edition ones, I don't believe they're starting at the at the bottom end, which makes sense. I right. think it's five five thousand launch edition vehicles, and then they're moving on to other versions. Right. It, for a new company like this, they need to get revenue as just as fast as they can. So it makes sense to sell the most expensive ones they have orders for. You know. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just makes, and 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 they've said, look, it, the software will come. So the the version you get at the beginning, no lane control, no cruise control. Even that's pretty basic. Like cars have had cruise control for a while, and it won't have that at launch. So yeah, lot, lots, lots still to come down the line. I don't right. mind that though. If you if you're taking a punt on a Fisker, come on, you don't expect it to be fully polished on day one, right? Uh, yeah, and it it is a bit of a, a, a risk, but it looks like it's coming along. I mean, I'm I'm very curious to see how this all develops because uh, yeah, he's definitely made it past the I think the the hardest part, you know, getting to production, and now it comes you know the harder part of you know staying alive and and rolling up product and making you keeping your customers happy and having a good product and, and servicing and all, all the other stuff that comes with a, a new automaker. Um, so some so other good news. To, uh, sorry, sorry to interrupt you. So I actually Please. talked to Henrik Fisker this year at the Goodwood Festival of Speed. I talked to him That's in true. person and what struck me most about my talk with him was just how confident he was in the, in the ocean. Whenever he talked about it, it was like, yeah, it's good. It's awesome. You'll see kind of right. attitude. It, right. it, it impressed me. It made me wonder how good the car really is. Okay. That's that's fair. Um, I wonder if he had that same attitude about his previous cars. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you're right. Um, <laughs> yeah. 
Wait, we're low on time. I, I was about to launch myself onto this karma, Fisker Karma rant, but I'll, I'll just hold that in um, because we have other good news that I really need to talk about real briefly that the Fiat 500e is coming to the U.S. market. The Fiat 500e, yes, we get another affordable and it's, it looks that's a two door too, right? That's a, yeah. Oh man, yes. That's, that's yes. like, oh, my heart. Be still my beating heart. This is great. Why wouldn't they sell this in the US? I know it's 42 kilowatt hour battery, but still. Um, but like, yeah, but it's better than the mini. Yes, yeah. everything has a purpose in life. Nothing, right. not everything has to go 300 miles. And so just... we we looked at one of these for my wife a couple of weeks ago. Okay. Um, and uh, we looked at the La Prima spec uh, with the convertible roof and it all folds down at the back. <laughs> and I was like, let's just buy this. She said, "No, it's too small. We have a small child, and all the stuff uh, that comes with it. Like, nice. oh, let's just let's have a big car and a small car, rather than you know two cars the same size on the driveway." But she wasn't keen. I wish I wish she'd have gone for it because I would have been borrowing it all of the time. But gone. Oh no, it's my wife's car. <laughs> I love it. So maybe you could have gotten the th the three door version that's asymmetrical. It has two doors on the right. Yes, or, or on the left in your case. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, Wait, maybe you can I've never seen that. this. They make that. Yeah, yeah, they, yeah, it's, yeah, you make it's an got, asymmetrical one. It's, oh, like a picture, it's so funny. Not sure it's if it's coming to the US, but in Europe, you can buy it with an extra but, door on the side. I didn't on know the side that. Side. So that's, uh, that's why we have you here, Andre, because we, did, we, we didn't know it. that. And I actually drove it. I loved it. I drove okay. the, the 500E like over a year ago, maybe two years ago now. It's brilliant. Yeah, this so is the on, one. On one side, you've got two doors, and on the other yeah, side, yeah. just one door. So because it's like why the original not? mini clubman, but yeah. you can get this in electric too, right? How how cool is that? Yeah. Get it in rose gold as well. It's brilliant. And it's yeah, not any great. longer or, or different. You just get you know like the body cut out, and you can open it on one side. It's it's pretty cool. It's it's a definitely a cool practical touch. Right, I would definitely consider. But what's you know what the range is for the uh, so is this a forty two kilowatt hour battery? Yeah, it's like 160, 100, 180, 160 uh, depends how you drive it. Yeah, right, one hundred eighty six miles, I guess. Uh, hmm. I mean, it's what you it's what you use a car for. It doesn't I have to be. I a think road I can make that work for. I can, yeah, and the the I, I like to see the price and and actually like see it in person drive it and see, feel how, how actually you've so you've driven it Andre how how robust do you think it feels like compared to like the outgoing 500 far superior so my girlfriend actually has the older um, 500 and I do drive okay. that on occasion and I uh -huh. don't like it okay. it's flimsy and it it's noisy and it feels right. like it's coming apart whereas right. this um, this feels much more solid and it, it even has like design Easter eggs. So like inside the, um, the door handle, you have uh, some design, you have the, the skyline of Turin on the dashboard. It's super nice and it's much better built overall. And it's clear that more th thought has gone into it, at least from my perspective. I really, really liked it. Okay. So he's just responding to somebody on the chat there. Oops. I think in the UK, I think you get the in the UK the door on the wrong side. Uh, maybe, I don't maybe know. you step out into traffic. How Italian? <laughs> right. That's fine. Just be quick. All right. Uh, so other things that the uh, couple other things we're right up against. Oh yeah, we're up against time. So you can check these out on Inside AVs. But the Genesis X concept has uh, become a convertible, and it's at the LA Auto Show. And that's worth checking out. Um, and on the Genesis Beat, there's also it's it's expanded it's uh, electrified g80 sales to four more states so and we'll pull that up real fast so yeah you can now buy the in maryland massachusetts new hampshire and virginia you can now buy the electrified g80 that's the electric version of their sedan it looks pretty nice um 311 no probably closer to 250 miles of range but uh yeah and that's about it, except uh, Canoe, which has uh, had its challenges this year, has announced a new vehicle manufacturing facility in Oklahoma City. And I thought that was worth mentioning. Um, and finally, the last little bit, it's not even on our list of things, but somebody mentioned in the comments earlier. So the uh, should, I thought I should mention it. The Volkswagen Trinity has been delayed until 2030 due to software problems, according to a report, which is kind of a big deal. I don't know, Kyle, have you heard about this? No, I have not, but it doesn't surprise me. 
I think they were planning on putting this out in 2026. So yep. already it's like a long ways off. I mean, relatively speaking. Well, but not for a off. brand new ground up situation. Right. But four years now, they're adding to the pushback, which is, man, that's significant. This was going to be in its own uh, factory. They're going to build a new factory for it, I believe. Right. Not, not right. a conversion. I think that's the case. You know, when you put something back to 2030, this is the new boss uh, of VW after Herbert Deese left. Uh, Oliver will it, will it ever see the light of day? Or do you put it back by four years and then just quietly axe it? And then, I don't know. I mean, as somebody in the comments pointed out earlier, there's like 3,000 Twitter engineers uh, and coders <laughs> currently looking for jobs. If I was VW, I'd be on LinkedIn right now being like, do you want to come and work here? Like, leave Silicon Valley. We'll allow remote work. Elon doesn't allow remote work anymore. Please come and fix our VW software. That's what I would be doing. Uh, I mean, I don't know how, how the code translates, but that might not be the worst yeah, idea, actually. They're but, smart uh, boys and girls, right? So, the, right. you know. I don't know what, what programming language they use, but uh, you know you need to get some Silicon Valley talent into the the German automakers pretty quickly to sort out software. Right. Um, so that's about it. Any, any, anybody else have anything they want to add before we close up shop for the day? Oh, just want to mention in Norway how many electric cars there are. Yeah, it's insane. And we're deep in the Arctic Circle right now. Sub freezing temperatures and still 30 percent of cars are full of battery electric it's so cool nice is it dark there uh, oh yeah i mean there's no light oh yeah it's okay i mean i thought i see the light all year round or something once you get up far enough so yeah right now it's like uh at least during the day we did not see um as far north as we were we didn't see the sun at all but it was still ah. bright out right but it wasn't so bright like Throughout the entire day, the car automatically chose to put the headlights on all day. Okay. All right. That's so interesting. on the same note of what Kyle mentioned, I was in Stockholm last week for the unveiling of the EX90, the new uh, Volvo electric SUV. True. And what struck me in Stockholm was just how many of the taxis were electric. And a great proportion of them were the new Mercedes EQE. Like it was super common there. It's like they, they've had it for years. And everybody, the EQE, they were all 350s. Wow. And it was super common. I, I, I took a lot of photos of them. I might use yeah, them in the post or something. That was, your... I found that super interesting. Wow. Andre, are we not going to talk about your VX90 situation? No. Uh, 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 so you've heard about that. We can we can talk about it afterwards. Just, which which VX90? I'm, I'm curious. Which situation was that? There, oh, uh, I just meant that he was there. I didn't know. Oh, yeah. Of a oh. <laughs> no I situation some sort of drama. I'm like, oh, my right. God, are you okay? I, mean, no. <laughs> no. I didn't mean situation in a bad way. I meant <laughs> you attended the event. It's not it's yeah. like you, you were. Yeah. No, no, yeah. no. So we should we should have had Andre on last week because we talked about the the Volkswagen EX90 last week on the on the Over. show and but Andre actually went and saw it in person and experience, got the experience. I don't actually, know if you want to take a. Sorry, there, there's just one in the world right now. That right. you can open and get inside of. They right. had two cars at the event, but one was locked, and you couldn't get near it. And only one car for hundreds of journalists. So I didn't get much time with it. Right, but in in, in person, it looks like like solid. an EX nine, like an XC ninety. Sorry. Okay. At How, least from I'm... a distance. I, I mean, the outline, the shape is. They they tried to keep it. It was intentional. They tried to keep it looking the same. Right. I'm right. I'm curious as you've seen the car now in person, how prominent is the lidar sensor that looks like it, a, it's the a first thing a taxi, I taxi like a taxi light that sits in the middle of a London black cab? I could not have described it better. It is it it it's the first thing I saw. It that that my eye immediately went there and I immediately thought taxi. So yeah, <laughs> wow. Okay. No, no, no other to, uh, to, to the to um, Volvo's lead designer. Um, robin page and people had all sorts of questions about how they managed to integrate it and if the, the design team hated that or not and apparently they did because it was kind of hard to integrate so yeah yeah that was that because was you have to put it very high otherwise you, it cannot see properly so yeah. apparently this one can see uh, up to 250 meters in complete darkness that's over 800 feet so yeah it's, it's there it's I mean, ugly it's but it's useful 
if it's right. dark and foggy and snowy, then LiDAR will see. And I, 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 I saw the same quote from him. I wasn't there, but he said uh, the engineers came to the designers and said, hey, in the animal kingdom, you put the eyes at the very top of the body. Uh, that's that's evolution. So the LiDAR has to go at the top of the car. because They want to bury it further down. So that's why LiDAR is where it is. And you want to look yeah. around and, and see obstacles that the, the human eye can't see yet. But it looks looks kind of ugly. Yeah, definitely. And one more thing about it. So they don't have any animal product in the vehicle that I know of anymore. That's good. And I actually got so the vehicle you could get aboard of had the wool seats. The upholstery is made of wool and it's super cozy. I wish more cars had that. Yeah, right. I, yeah, we're looking forward to it. I would highly recommend you try it out if you're going to buy a Volvo EX90 or a, a Volvo with that upholstery option. Consider it. It's awesome. Right. All right. So but 100 think... grand, but 100 grand for a Volvo badge. That's that starts to push people into I new mean, places. Volvo is up it's quick. scale. It has a big battery. It has a lot of tech. Volvo swears you won't die in one, so the, you know. Great right, top safety, the best sound you'll probably ever experience in a car. Yeah, 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 of course. Yeah. Volvo insists that you're you w cannot die in this vehicle, or you won't be able to. So, right. Don't want to put that right. to the test. It's just what they they want to. That's worth money, staying alive. All right. Exactly. Well, but before we go, Dom, I want to make sure uh, that we ask Andre how we can follow your YouTube videos that I showed a little clip of earlier. So my YouTube channel is called One Tire Fire. I'm I I review the cars in Romania, but I review them in English for an international audience, which I think for some people might be interesting. So yeah, the channel is called One Tire Fire. You can definitely subscribe if you think you might like my content. Yes. I'm also on Instagram where I actually post, I made a post. It's also uh, One, One Tire, tire fire. fire underscore YT for YouTube. And I actually made a post about the EQE spottings in, the, in, in Stockholm. So yeah, right. I'm on YouTube and Instagram. All right. One Tire Fire. One tire fire. So that brings us to the end of our show. If you have any questions or comments, you can leave them on the Inside EVs Forum podcast thread or on our YouTube or Twitch comment sections. If you like the show, please give us a thumbs up if you're watch watching us on YouTube. Don't forget you can find and follow our panelists on Twitter. Follow Tom Malogny at Tomalog, that's with two M's. Martin Lee is at EV News Daily. Kyle Connor is at It's Kyle Connor. You can find Andre at uh, One Tire Fire on YouTube and Instagram. Um, and I'm at on Twitter at Dominic underscore Y. Click, click subscribe and tap that bell icon for notifications. And we'll see you all again next week. Ciao.